Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find us. Go ahead, rate us, review us. We like five stars. Give us four stars. We're probably going to wind up thinking that you are a hater. It's Thursday as we record this. That's when we do our interviews. And on the line with us right now, Gary Indiana's own. You can check out his new uh, mixtape, Freddie. I don't even know if in stores now is the way to say it anymore, Freddie Gibbs. Like, just go find the record wherever you find it. Yeah, you just gotta go find it. I'll be, you know, Best Buy stopped selling CDs last week, so you know, I don't, you know. <laughs> Dude, I saw that, and I was like, I spent so much time in my life going into Best Buy just to look at CDs and not even buy them, and that used to be a trick to get you in the store. I don't know why you're going in now. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I, don't, I guess people go get a washing machine from Best Buy. I, I don't know. You can get everything on Amazon now, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, now, I want to ask you this before we get to talking about uh, the music, right? Fast. I saw Pac-Man Jones had to get a visa to do it in the Atlanta airport, and I just had to get your immediate thoughts on seeing that. Oh, yeah, that was personal. That was definitely personal. <laughs> definitely, uh, you know, Pac-Man probably swung through the strip club and, you know, and, and took one of the dudes, the airport dudes, girls, <laughs> or something like that. But, you know, when he seen him at work, man, he had some words for him. But it was definitely personal. You know what I mean? To go after, a, you know, a professional athlete, especially a football player, you know, to pick a fight with him in, in the airport at work, to risk your job and everything, that definitely had to be personal. That was my thing, too. It's like, you are going to get fired. The dude got beat up, the dude got arrested, and he's probably going to wind up getting fired. Right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely going to get fired. Like, so, but this is one thing, though, about you, like, actual real-life famous people is people just seem to try to walk up on y'all. Yeah, you know what? I mean, especially rappers, too, man. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. I think just people just, just don't have, like, etiquette when it comes to, you know, athletes and you know and, and, you know people with celebrity and stuff like that i think they you know sometimes they cross the line you know they, they feel you know they know you personally you know sometimes that could get you know that could get tricky you know i as in the case with pop pac-man jones well what's the worst situation you've had with somebody trying to come up on you feeling entitled to your time and space oh man oh man uh wow so many incidents uh probably like just having a fan like uh probably like having fans like run up and like try to like kiss me i don't like that i don't like you know exchanging like you know bodily fluids on me and stuff like that you know and you know i, I don't be liking that you know one time a dude tried to kiss me at one of these uh you know promo things you know i wanted to slap him like will smith slapped that dude but i didn't want to go there so <laughs> it's you know you know a lot of times you know they violate your personal space but you just you know you just take it a smile and just you know on with it. You don't want to get sued out here. I mean, that dude might sue Pac-Man Jones for beating him up in the airport. You never know. Dude, the wildest thing about that was this is the first time ever that the police have taken Pac-Man Jones' side on anything. Like, I read that whole statement and thought they were talking about somebody else. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I seen that too, and I was like, wow, Pac-Man, I'm surprised that he didn't get arrested. Nope. They were like, we talked to Mr. Jones, and it was clear that he had been attacked and everything else. And I was like, when is the last time Pac-Man was like, no, bring the police over here. I'd love to talk to them and explain exactly how I was violated. Yeah, that, that that's crazy. You know, but I mean, you know, either way it goes, I still think it's uh, bad publicity for the NFL, though. You know, no, it's not a win <laughs> for them. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's another bad incident. You know, what I mean, for the NFL, I mean, you know, it's, it's been a lot of bad. I mean, some terrible incidents this week for the for the NFL. You know, that that really don't look too good. You know, I'm, I'm glad Pac Man didn't go to jail. It didn't get. You know, I, he shouldn't get suspended for that. You know, because clearly, I guess he was defending himself, but. You know, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the NFL right now. It's a bad time to be a football player. And that's the other thing I was going to say, that we come a long way with where Papa John was making the NFL look worse than Pac-Man Jones was. <laughs> yeah, Papa Jones, Papa Jones is nasty anyway. He canceled. This, that piece is, that's, that's some of the worst pieces in America. I don't even know how he got to be the NFL sponsor. So, you know, he's canceled. <laughs> Indeed, man. Dude, so the new record, I told you about this when I first saw it, and you had, like, the R&B stuff on the Internet. It never dawned on me that you were actually putting a record out with this. And then I saw the Teddy Pendergrass original record that was like Freddie as you did it right now. So where did this idea all come together? Uh, Man, you know what? I was <laughs> I was putting this tape together, and I was just like, man, I just wanted to just do something that, uh, you know, nobody else was doing. And I just wanted to just, you know, promote it in a way that you know, was creative and funny at the same time. It's like, you know, I'm from... I'm from the east side of Gary, Indiana, and I don't have to prove to nobody that I'm hard. I don't have to, you know, make my artwork look like something that's, you know, fresh out of the, you know, the, the, the trap house or something like that. So I was just like, man, let's just be lighthearted and have fun with this. And I saw the Teddy Pendergrass cover, and I was like, man, Teddy, Freddie, and I just, man, just got to just, you know, comparing. And I was like, if I could recreate this thing, that would be dope. So 
you know, me and Lambo, we put it together. We just, you know, we did the photo shoot and just made it pop. Now, how much fun was it shooting all of that? Because the video, like the 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 like Time Life video, you know, with featuring songs, like you know, so legit, <laughs> da da da. Like, how much fun was that for you to do? Man, it, it, it's crazy. You know what? I shot all of that stuff in my house too. That's the crazy part. Really? So it's like I just got up and I just woke up one morning and I was like, man, let's just you know, let's just do this. Let's just make it pop. So. You know, I saw, I saw, I did all of that at home, you know, so I just went in the closet, got a suit, and had the cameraman come over. Now, what was the process like for the recording on this one? <laughs> so, like, on, on the album or the, or the fake album? Well, I go for both. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, man, it was just basically, you know, I think that this project is probably one of my most, like, uh, fun projects. You know what I'm saying? Because, uh, you know, I mean, I, I mean, like right now, you know, making music and all of that is fun. You know, and I was like making music to, you know, to, you know, when I was struggling doing it, it's, it's never good being a struggling artist. You know, when I was struggling to make it, making music, you know, it was difficult. But, you know, it's like now, you know, I'm at a certain, a, a good point in my career. It's like, oh, you know, all the music can just be fun. Everything is just lighthearted. I think that the whole process of this was just being loose, man. I think I'm, you know. In a, in, I'm in a zone where, you know, my rhymes is more loose. Everything, I just, you know, I'm just really just, I don't even think I wrote nothing down on this project. I don't, you know, I, I haven't wrote a rap in years. Now, I thought that it was going to be another pinata that came out before this one, though. See, yeah, that's what everybody was thinking. So I hit him with the curveball. So, you know, I feel like this kind of bought me some time because everybody waiting on that, uh, you know, that, that, that second pinata. They waiting on that bandana right now. So, you know, but I think this was a good, uh, a good way to ease them into that. So that's why I had to put this out. It was summertime, you know what I mean? I just wanted to, you know, to get my trap on on this project. I was about to say, you hit me with the curveball. You told me to look out for the pinata. And then next thing I knew, it was the R&B record. No, oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. There's going to be some R&B singing on the, on the, on the next pinata joint, on the bandana joint. There's gonna, definitely going to be some singing on that too, man. You know, we implement everything, man. We're just having fun. Like I said, man, if, you, you know, if you're not smiling while you're making music, then you should stop doing it. Now, you said you hadn't, like, written down rhymes in a long time. Why that change? You know what? Like, like I said, when I go in the booth now, I feel like um, if I don't write the raps, I'm totally focused on the microphone. I think everything comes out sounding better because I can't, like, read nothing while I'm, like, rapping. I don't like that. I don't like to read a phone. I don't want to read a piece of paper. I'd rather just, you know, uh, just go in there with the rap in my head or, you know what I mean, or, like I said, or, or, or just punch line for line or, you know, however I got to do it because I feel like that's more, you know, uh, productive for me. I get more music done. And uh, like I said, I feel like it's more relaxed, it's more loose, you know what I mean? I can do more things, you know, I can play with the beat a little bit more, you know what I mean? So Now, are you a perfectionist at all about it? Because I feel like the one part from writing that will come is that ability to make it a little better, a little better, a little better. Nah, definitely. I'm definitely a perfectionist. You know what I mean? I just, you know perfected doing it that way you know what i mean so i mean and there ain't you know too many human beings walking the earth that could do that probably like jay-z kendrick lamar maybe you know what i mean and like me you know <laughs> so <laughs> there ain't that many people that could really you know put it together like that you know what i mean so you know i think it's you know it's just a, a testament to you know what i bring to the game my talent level you know like when you're writing though i'm curious like what the process is like for you because there are a lot of cats like eminem who talks about it who's just like how hard the writing process is for him and then the other cats that can just like sneeze these things out yeah i think that um i feel like when i hear a track you know what i mean or when we when we make a track or put one together if i don't if, if i'm not like writing to it or vibing to it in my head like as it's playing and you know it, it might not be the right one for me you know what I mean? So I think it all goes off of the music. You know what I mean? I think that, uh, you know, the music kind of fuels the, the groove and the, and the writing and the vibes too, man. It's, it's, it's all kind of elements, you know what I mean? That come into play when you write music. I think, I, I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that it's like, you know, people that have, you know, complained about like writer's block and all that. They just, you know, they're just not in the right vibe or the right setting. I don't think, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I got a house in the hills. So, you know what I mean? I'm up here, you know, <laughs> looking down at everything, you know what I mean, just chilling. So I'm just, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a good vibe, you know what I mean. I'm recording at home. I'm just waking up, going upstairs to my studio. So, you know, that, like I said, everything's more relaxed now, man. And I think that's the best state to be in when you're uh, making music. Well, what's it like writing gangster rap in the hills, right? Because you had some cats. Like I remember once when Big Mike moved back into the Florida projects in New Orleans because he said he didn't feel like he had to hunger anymore, and I don't want to be that hungry ever myself personally. But like, I nah, wonder like, the contrast I, I, he, between he that, that life and the kind of stuff you often do. Nah, he could. He, they could have that lifestyle, man. You know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, it, it's definitely. Uh, like I said, it definitely feels better. 
writing these raps up in the hills and writing them in the projects. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, that's cool. Like I said, uh, I ain't got nothing to prove on that end. You know, I've been through that. You know, I'm a taxpaying American citizen. I'm a father right now, you know, so I'm just <laughs> trying to just do what I got to do, man, and, and, you know, walk the straight line and just and just do this music, man. So, you know, I, you know, so a lot of guys in the rap game feel like, you know, the need to go back you know what I mean, to where they from and, you know, steadily immerse themselves within that, uh, you know, I, I feel like I don't, I don't, I don't got a need to do that. I don't got nothing to prove. Well, was there a moment that you realized you were like, nah, man, I'm not going back. I'm just not. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I mean, honestly, uh, you know, uh, when you on tour and, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and homies start getting locked up and, you, you know, you going to jail and then, you, you know, you know, at a certain point, you realize, you know, you could jeopardize everything that you work for, you know, uh, musically. So it's just like, man, I don't want to throw this away for nothing in the street. You know what I mean? Really, honestly, to be to be quite honest, when I had my daughter, that's when I really, really, really separated myself from a lot of people, a lot of things, you know, on the streets. You know what I mean? Totally. You know what I mean? Because I was just like, man, you know, it's, it's, it's no way that I could, uh, you know, miss a day with my daughter, you know, being behind bars. I can't do that. Well, Karis, like before you started rapping, how much had you seen like in the world outside of Gary? You know what? Before I started rapping, um, I didn't see nothing. You know what I mean? All I saw was Gary, and Gary is a city that's uh, ninety-eight, basically ninety-eight percent black. I didn't even know before I moved to California. I don't even think I don't even think that I had met a Jewish person before. You know, so I didn't need, I didn't really understand the concept of you know what I mean. Uh, 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 being Jewish and, and all of that stuff. And, you know, I was basically, we were, we were at a cultural, like, deadlock in Gary at, at a certain, you know, somewhat, you know, poor education system, you know what I mean, economically deprived, you know what I mean, it's deteriorating. So, you know, uh, you know, thank God for this music because it's taking me all over the world, man. I've seen so many things, so many different countries, man. Oh, man, I mean, shit, I never thought I'd go to Australia. I've been to Australia, like, four times, you know what I mean, so... It's crazy, you know what I mean? This thing, you know, this music has, you know, definitely educated me and opened my mind to a lot of different things that I, you know, would have never seen just sitting in Gary, Indiana, definitely. Well, like you mentioned Gary, and I think that's like a generational thing, right? Like cats my age, you hear Gary and people know what we used to always talk about Gary, even if you didn't live there. But I feel like for younger people, like Gary, Indiana doesn't ring out as like a place that they should recognize and know about. So like for you, how would you describe Gary to somebody who hadn't been there? Oh, uh, man. I mean, it's always home, man. You know what I mean? It's it's hard to not have the, you know what I mean, the, the negative thoughts about it. Like, you know, when, you know, when you've been there and you've seen so much, uh, you know, uh, you know, bury homies and, you know what I mean, and, and people going to jail. You, you know, you got so many bad stories and horror stories coming out of there. But I can't say this, man. There's good people and good, talented, hardworking, smart people there. You know, we definitely get overlooked. You know what I mean? In the uh, grand scheme of things, you know what I mean? Because of, you know, where we're at, you know what I mean? I definitely, um, I definitely got overlooked as a rapper being from there. So if I didn't branch out, then I wouldn't be talking to you right now. If I would have just sat there and tried to just do it on my own locally, it probably would have took me 10 more years to get notoriety. So, you know, it, it's a difficult place to, you know, come up out of. But, you know, when you do, you definitely appreciate it that much more. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I just like, you know, it's right outside Chicago. I think I told you about this. I was driving up from Louisville one time and I was on right. like gaslight and I come up on the Gary exit and it was a real decision that we had to make about whether or not we needed gas that bad. And we decided we didn't, to be perfectly honest, because that was just what we had right. heard, you know? Bro, it, it's definitely cheaper gas. <laughs> Everybody coming over the state line to get cheaper gas and cheaper cigarettes, man. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, they definitely not staying long. Yeah, so like, so for you, when you got to California, like, how did that did that affect your music instantly once you got there? Yeah, I say so. Um, you know, being here definitely. Uh, like I said, man, it it, it broadened my horizon to a lot of a lot of things. Like I said, I it was, it was certain races and uh, people that I had never even really like met before. I don't think I ever met a Filipino person before I moved to California. You know what I mean? So it's just like like wow. You know what I mean? Like and it, and you know, it was just a real learning experience you know what i mean and i was young man i was like you know like 20 21 years old you know first coming out here i've been here for a long time now so you know it's like i kind of like grew up here as well you know what i mean it's like i grew up in gary indiana and i you know i kind of like lived my second childhood in california you know what i mean and um it's been great i love it here man i'm you know it's home now too so 
Yeah, like I was 21 when I moved to California, and that was the biggest culture shock. Like, I didn't know it was possible to have that kind of culture shock within the country. But when I got there, I was just like, this is really just totally different than anything that I have seen before. Did you experience that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the traffic alone was a shell shock. I was like, wow, is this many cars in the world? Like, what is this? Like, I feel like every car in the world is on the 405 right now. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, 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 was def- it was definitely a culture shock, man. All right, now, um, you mentioned your daughter, and I, I enjoy following you on Instagram. I think a lot of us do. And one of the more entertaining things to watch is, like, Freddie Gibbs, the happiest gangster in the world, hanging out with his daughter. Like, was like, was having kids something that you wanted to do before this, or is it just something that once you were there, just like, oh, man, I really, like, this is so much fun? Man, I, you know what? I, You know, of course I always wanted kids. I didn't know when it was going to happen or, you know what I mean, because I, you know, I didn't have her until I was in my 30s. But, uh, you know, uh Bro, it's, it's it's the light of my life. Um, I couldn't, you know, think of anything that I would much rather do than to kick it with my daughter, man. Like, uh, you know, she's definitely changed my whole perspective on uh, on life and, and everything. You know what I mean? Just she made me want to, you know, get get everything together in my life. You know what I mean? And I just, I don't know. I just, I can't. Every day, I just want to just get up and just just squeeze her and just thank her, man, because you know she she kind of saved me, man. She saved me from a. Uh, you know, I was going on a, a crazy path, and you know, what I mean, it, you know, this this music industry could definitely take you on some some trips, and uh, you know, having I really, you know, put things in perspective for me. So, you know, I thank God for that. Well, what do you think is the biggest change in your perspective that you could point to? Um, maybe probably uh, the way I um, uh, hmm, that's a good one. Probably the way I, I probably I, I think I, that I revere women even more because I got a daughter. You know, you feel me? You know, what I mean, I always you know put women on a high pedestal. You know, I love my mother and my sister, but it's like now that I have a daughter, it's like oh man, you know, I feel like it's you know protect women, especially black women at all costs. You know what I mean? So, so that definitely you know made, gave me a, a definitely a higher respect. And I, you know, I mean, seeing her mom push her out, I was like wow, you know, that was crazy. Oh, you were there so, for it. Yeah, yeah, I was definitely right there, there every step of the way. So I was just like, "Wow," you know what I mean. So, uh, you know, that definitely gave me a new respect for her. I, you know, that was that's crazy. If men had to have babies, it wouldn't be no babies. <laughs> yeah, everybody tells me it's the most intense thing in the world, and you just absolutely have to be there for it. And I just can't imagine everything that's going on in that circumstance and realizing that you were a part of it. You know? Oh my God, I was just like, man, that was that was crazy. I felt like I was just seeing somebody get mutilated on the table. <laughs> I just, and I couldn't do nothing for her. I was like, oh, man, like, what, you know, like, what do you want me to do? But uh, it was, you know, it was definitely an experience. It definitely gave me a higher respect for her, for sure. Well, you said your daughter, you know, affected, like, the reverence that you have for women. Does that at all, like, does that affect the way that you make your music at all? No, nah, not at all, man. <laughs> I would still make the same, you know, kind of music, you know what I mean? I'm going to, uh, you know, please my fans. You know, like I said, man, with music, I just go with the vibe, man. Like, I don't... Um, I don't think that I need to, uh, you know, censor my music or make different kind of type of music because I got a daughter now. I mean, she loves the music. She knows, you know what I mean, um, it's daddy having fun. And, you know, I'm definitely I'm definitely not going to, you know, do certain things, you know, to endanger my child whatsoever. But I would say that, you know, I, I feel like when you, like, censor a child and shelter a child too much, you kind of, you know, make things taboo. And then they want to experience things on their own without your guidance. So I just feel like, you know, I just got to, you know, I just got to nail this parenting thing down. And, you know, that's my main um, concern. And, you know, my, my job is my job. I totally keep that separate. So it is what it is. Now, is she in charge in this operation? Because I find that daughters have a way of being in charge. Man, she already making music. She on my album, you know what I mean? So, you know, she running around in here and I'm trying to, that's why I got to wait till she go to sleep to start working. So, but, uh, you know, she's definitely always, she's definitely bossy, just like her mom. Oh, man, see, you ain't have to throw her in there, man. I was going to let that part slide. <laughs> <laughs> now, you talked about, uh, you know, your daughter and hearing your music. Uh, does your father-in-law, Eric Dickerson, ride around listening to Gangsta Gibbs? I don't know. Maybe he do. You know what I'm saying? I know Bo Jackson, he'd be bumping my music. I remember when I was at a golf tournament, and he didn't want to sign my football. And I had to, you know, let him know who I was. I was like, hey, man, he got to sign this ball, man. <laughs> oh, uh, you were the golf, you and, but, uh, you and uh, Bo Jackson were the same golf tournament? Oh, yeah, I was at a golf tournament with, like, Bo Jackson, Tim Brown, T.O., Jim Brown, who else, uh, LT, who else? I went with Eric, 
it was cool. I was in. Man, shout out to Eric for taking me to that. That was, that was one of the coolest things I've been to. Uh, who else was there? Man, Marcus Allen. Man, you name all everybody. And I, everybody signed my football. Today. I got a football with like all those people's uh, signatures on it. So I got to, you know, I got that framed up in the house. Now, do you play golf? Nah, you know what, man? I've been going to Top Golf because I like hitting the ball <laughs> real far and going to the driving range. So, but you know, I, I probably got to work on the whole putting thing and all of that. So, I'm, I'm definitely, I, I'm definitely appreciative of the game. I just got to get into it. I haven't had time to go, you know, actually play and get some clubs and all of that stuff. You know, plus I got to get find some people to play with. Guys, don't want to play with you. You know, Scarface is like super into golf now. I know he won't play with me. I've been Are you asking, serious? I've been asking. I've been asking Faith to play to play some golf with me for the last five years, and he will not take me to the golf course. He was, he just be like, man, you going to slow me down. I ain't got time to do that. <laughs> He's serious. He's serious, bro. He's like, I feel nah, that, I feel that though, because I'm awful at golf, right? Like, And so I always get nervous about playing with people or anything because I'm going to slow them down. But next time I'm out there, we got to roll out there and play some golf because actually playing is not that much harder than the driver range as long as you don't get mad about being sorry. It's just four hours yeah, to hang out with your partners in, in, in the sunshine. Let's do it, man. You know what I'm saying? Eric loves to golf. I'll definitely, you know, we definitely go golfing. You know what I'm saying? I'm definitely with that. Yeah, like, because I have imagined this for this little girl that Freddie Gibbs on one side and Eric Dickinson as her grandfather. Ain't nobody about to be messing with her, I feel like. Nah, nah, nah. Totally not. Two tall, bald head dudes. I hope not. Nah. Ain't nobody messing with her. So what was it like for you, like, when you first met, when you first met Eric Dickinson, right? Like, how'd that go for you? Mm-hmm. Um... <laughs> I don't know. It was kind of weird because I was just like, oh, man, this, you know, I mean, you know, somebody you grow up, you know, watching on TV, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. You grow up idolizing somebody and then they end up, you know, end up being in the family with them. And, you know, it's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> it was cool. You know what I mean? I just like, you know, I just kept it cool. You know what I mean? It was all, uh, he was always, you know, nice and always giving advice. You know, he was he definitely like a father figure type of guy. So, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't feel, uh, he didn't make me feel, uh, threatening anything like that you know he was always welcoming he always welcomed people in this crib he's, he's a real loving guy man and you know i don't think a lot of people know that yeah because i would have expected that he would try to check you like that would be my first yeah, guess I, I, hey man come on black man from texas i knew he was gonna be on some, you know i just knew he was gonna be on some you know crazy stuff but uh you know he's cool he's one of the coolest guys that i know you know what i mean you know i could talk to him about you know whatever so i, hey, I, I appreciate him have you been out there to see yet where he's from no, I haven't been to Sealy yet, but I need to go out there though. Yeah, I want, I want, like when you go, I want you to highlight me because I'd be very curious to see your impressions of Sealy, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it's like Eric always tells me it's like a one road, one horse town. It's like small, so you know you gotta like travel into town to get groceries and all of that stuff. So I'm like, all right. She said they don't get too much more country than Sealy, Texas, so. <laughs> Except it does. That's the craziest part. Like, <laughs> it's small, but then there's stuff around Sealy. There's still people who live in towns around Sealy that I assure you are going to Sealy when they need something because Sealy is actually not as country as it gets. Oh, it ain't that bad. Okay, cool. I need to oh, no, 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 no. I ain't say it wasn't that bad. I just said it gets worse. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a different level of, like, what kind of country that you wind up with, man. So the, where, where do you want to go with this from now? Well, with the music? Yeah, music and all of it, man. Like, where where do you see yourself going from here? Hey, man, honestly, to be honest, you know what? Today, I'm shooting my I'm shooting a movie today. I'm shooting a short film today. It's, it's like my first uh, role that I'm getting. So, uh, really, uh, honestly, I'm trying to, like, transition in the, the acting world, uh, you know, the, the comedy world, you know, all the little, like, all the little promo videos I've been doing for the album, been, you know, been real hilarious. So, like, people been, like, Hit me from that end, you know, and I, you know, I, you know, I kind of want to, you know, develop some shows and, you know, do some creative things, you know, outside of music, you know what I mean? And, um, and just keep pushing, man. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm definitely not going to rap forever. I love it. You know what I mean? But, uh, you know, I want to produce artists, you know what I mean? I want to act. I want to do a lot of things. So, you know what I mean? The sky's the limit, you know what I mean? At this point for me. Now, if I were to rewind two years from now, how worried were you that none of this would happen? Man, very worried, you know what I mean, with uh with especially uh, you know, dealing with that case and all of that stuff, you know what I mean? Um I mean, you know, I got God on my side, man, so I wasn't um I never lost faith, but I was definitely, you know what I mean, in a position where, you know, I thought that I was, you know, um being uh, you know, it was a, a like a witch hunt and it was racially and financially motivated, you know what I mean? And I um 
you know, just the thought of that, you know, when I go back to those thoughts instantly, I think about my daughter and, you know, those six months, you know, being away from my daughter and then having to fly her out there all the way to another country to, to see me, you know what I mean? So, you know, she, she really gave me, you know, she was my glimmer of hope in that situation. You know what I mean? That's so, like I said, I, I, I love her to death. Well, how difficult was it for you after the fact to try to like, when you have to come and talk to people after an allegation of sexual assault to try to explain what did or did not happen? Exactly. See, now that was, you know, that was something that me and Lambo was really, really um, dead set on, you know, doing in the correct fashion. You know what I mean? Because even with the music, man, like I didn't want to just like come back out like, you know, like like the the kind of music that I made on this Freddie project. You know what I mean? Like it seems like, you know, it's happy, it's relaxed, it's fun. You know what I mean? It's, tra- it's fun trap music. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I wasn't in that mode when I came, you know what I mean, from Austria when I got out of that situation. I was still, you know, scarred. I was still mad. I, and, you know, I still, you know, they, and they still owe me a million dollars, matter of fact, you know, not to mention that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I was still, you know what I mean, hurt behind that situation. Like, how could somebody accuse me of something like this and, you know, try to scar my name? So, you know, my main thing coming back was the reparation of my name. I had to, like, make my name back correct because, you know, I feel like if that would have happened, and right now, and I wouldn't have had a chance in the court of law to prove my innocence, you know, it would have been a stain on my name forever because there's a lot of guys out here that's, you know, getting accused of things and they don't, and, and it's not going to trial or it's no evidence of anything. They just, you know, they just look bad. You know what I mean? And, you know, like, but, you know, from from the very start of these allegations, everybody knew, everybody that knows me knows, knew that I didn't have anything to do with this and I'm not that, that type of guy. So, uh, you know, um, I wasn't worried in that regard, but, you know, from an industry standpoint, I was definitely like, okay, I got to, you know, execute all my steps correctly, you know what I mean, to, you know, show people that, you know, this this is not what this is. And I didn't, you know, get off on some legal technicality. I, it, I didn't plead to nothing. Like, I literally got acquitted because there was no evidence of any of me doing anything because I didn't do any wrong wrongdoing, you know what I mean? So, uh you know, just clearing your name in this game is is, is tough. But uh, you know, I think I successfully did that. And like I said, everybody that knows me knows I'm not a, I'm not into that type of stuff anyway. I despise those type of guys. Yeah, I remember it was a trigger for me because Lambo would hit me up and was like, "Yo, I just want to let you know that Freddie was innocent." And I was like, "Cool, let me know how it goes." Because I actually had a buddy who was in a similar situation, except we later found out that he had committed like a series of crimes, and we had no idea, right. you know. And so that becomes like for you and clearing your name, and then I imagine for some people that were close to you, you had the people who were like, "I know he would never do that," but also I guess there were probably a lot of people who had to hear from you to say that, not just believe. Right, correct. You know, and I think that the thing that I did on um on vice land with the therapist that was real good for me because it got to show that you know what i mean uh you know it, it got to you know show show the the, the the you know i really got to tell my story you know what i mean and it, it showed you know who i really was i think you know what i mean so uh you know i just think that um like i said and when i came out with you only live twice you know with records like crushed glass and stuff like that, that was the first project i came out when i when i got out of that situation you know, I felt like I was kind of like still kind of like telling the story of that, you know what I mean? And like now, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, I'm blessed to be out of that situation and, you know, moving on to, you know, bigger and better things. So, like I said, the music is more happy, it's more fun, it's loose. And, you know, I'm I'm, I'm loving life right now, man. My daughter's in preschool now, man. I, you know, I can't complain about nothing at all. You know, God is good. Now, one thing I thought about was you talking about making the fun music. Was there, was there a time in your career where you were the cat that was opposed to making fun music? Um, you know what? I never was opposed to it. You know what I mean? I never was opposed to making fun music. I mean, because I felt like Snoop Dogg and all those guys were making fun music, you know, over there at Death Row, and they was making doggy style and, and things of that nature. You know what I mean? I feel like at a certain point, I feel like when I started rapping, I feel like rap was in a place where, I don't know, I feel like you had to be hard or you had to be, I started rapping in the 50 Cent era, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I feel like that was kind of a, a real grimy, you know, gutter, you know, era of rap, you know what I mean? You know, early 2000s and stuff. So, you know, I just feel like, you know, the, the climate of uh, what music is in some ways would dictate the kind of music you make, I think, especially if you're trying to sell records, I think. Yes. Yeah, so what do you think about the climate of today? Oh, man, I feel like 
um, music right now, the Wild Wild West. I mean, just like when we opened the conversation, you said, I don't even know where to go say in stores now. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like right now, like, anybody could just drink. You in time, any amount, you could drop a three song album now. Like, it's like I don't know. I, I love it. I feel like the artists have more freedom nowadays. I, you know, I look at the music industry kind of like, um, I don't know, the NBA. You know what I mean? I feel like the artists, you know, I feel like the NBA is one of those leagues that empower their players more. And I feel like nowadays, um, that uh, you know, the with, with the rap game being the way it is with streaming, I feel like the you know, the artists are more empowered. You know, because, you know, we can do licensing deals with labels. We don't have to do, like, uh, uh, straight-up record deals anymore. We can, you know, we can own our masters, you know what I mean? I feel like uh, a lot of more rappers are educated, you know what I mean, on uh, monetizing themselves even more so than, you know, the, the rappers uh, before us, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that, though, because I think for a lot of people it seems like it's a lot harder to make money. I don't, I don't know. I'm good. <laughs> I, I think that um I, I mean like i said man the the physical aspect of music you know it's kind of I, I just think that right now you got to be innovative man you know every everything is you know is subject to change you know and it's crazy because i was watching i was watching uh your show and y'all was talking about uh how the nba should you know do conference i mean non-conference basketball you know what i mean and just do the season and I'm like, man, you know, what I mean, I mean, it's kind of like you know the rap game, you know, you kind of gotta, you know, evolve to that, you know, because you know things are gonna change, man, you know what I mean? And you know, they, it, it's no way. I don't know how we're gonna be getting our music in 20 years, you know what I mean? We didn't, you know, when they started Napster, you know, when was that? Probably like what 15 years ago? Yeah, we didn't almost, know that Napster and LimeWire and all of that stuff. We didn't know that it was gonna go into this, you know what I mean? That was, a, you know a precursor for what music is now. You know what I mean? So, I mean, like I said, in 20 years, it, it might, it could be something totally different. I just think that you got to be, uh, innovative with, uh, the marketing of an artist. You know what I mean? I feel like, uh, people, it's more so, uh, a popularity contest than it is about the music. You know what I mean? Cause you can get a guy that has some trash music and he can get a lot of views. I think that artists these days need to just focus on like you know marketing themselves correctly you know what i mean i hate to say that you know that the music comes second but i mean it's, it's the honest to god truth you yeah, know i mean i guess mean? the but, thing once you decide you're gonna sell it you gotta sell it right yeah exactly but at the same time no good music always does prevail though. if you got great music it's gonna shine through you know what i mean because i you know i think that's definitely worked in my favor because i'm not uh, on a major label ahead of all the major label backing and marketing behind me is you know uh, other uh, of my peers you know what I mean? But I can still, you know, I still get the respect of my peers and, you know, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, like I said, good music will always prevail, but that marketing is important, very important. Well, I'll tell you why we got you here. I got to talk a little sports here since you're living in L.A., man. What do you think about LeBron showing up? What? I, I'm the Le, a LeBron stan, my friend. You know what I mean? LeBron <laughs> is the best player since Mike, you know what I mean? So, I mean, having him in L.A. now, now, now give me a reason to watch the Lakers because I never liked the Lakers. Oh, but really? Now I'm like, Lake, I'm Laker down now. I'm I'm big Laker fan. I'm trying to get tickets right now. <laughs> what do you think about the Kobe fans, though? They seem to be trying. They haven't quite made peace with this yet. Man, Kobe fans, man. You know what, man? I was never a Kobe fan. You know why? Because Kobe was like, now I respect his game totally. You know what I mean? No, no disrespect to him at all. He's definitely one of the you know top top ten players of all time. But uh, I don't know. His game was just too similar to Mike, man. You know what I mean? And like in that, you know, and I was still on my Michael Jordan hangover when Kobe was in domination. So I was just like, oh, it still ain't Mike. It ain't Mike. You know, it was like Kanye. It ain't Ralph. You know what I mean? So <laughs> it was just like you know that that was always my attitude toward Kobe. So I never was a Kobe fan. You know, with that being said, but I always respect his game. He's a killer. He's one of the you know. Like I said, one of the greatest of all time. But I definitely, I think LeBron just brought something that we never seen to the game. That's why I love his game so much, man. And like, you know, he, uh, to me in my in my mind, he's miles ahead of Kobe. You know, what I mean, when it comes comes to playing basketball, I think, you know. Hey, man, the, the LeBron with the Lakers, man. The league is better with LeBron on the Lakers. Period. Come on, it's way better, man. What, like, man, like you said, man, he cannot go to dinner with. Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro in Cleveland. That's just not happening. Dog. You cannot set that up. Like you said, you cannot set that up in Cleveland. That's what we need. That, LeBron has to be in a big city. It, it had to either be L.A. or New York, man. You know what I mean? Like, he's just too big. He's too big for Cleveland, man. 
Well, that's the wildest thing to me about that with with him going to dinner with uh, Pacino and DiCaprio. And you're really like, yo, but LeBron's the biggest star here, like even in L.A. And I wonder how that's going to go for him because, like, he did it in Miami. He lived in Cleveland. But now you're in L.A. and you're, like, fully realizing, like, no, you're the biggest thing here, too. He, yeah, yeah, bro. That's why he didn't. That's why he didn't go. Uh, he didn't show up to the Blaze Pizza. <laughs> it could have been a riot. Everyone <laughs> that I drove past between two and five had like a thousand people outside. Thinking LeBron was gonna be there. I was like, man, this is crazy. I went to the mall by my house. It was so packed I couldn't even get in the parking lot. I was like, wow. I was like, is he there? They like, nah, he ain't even there. <laughs> Dang. Now, are you still are you still a Bears fan? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm that hard, Bears. I tell you what, I'm not a Bulls fan. I'm Lakers. Oh, you came up. You came up back. I, I came up. I, yeah, I, I, I just, you know, I just got rid of him. You know, John Paxson, be, you know, I don't like the way John Paxson be moving, man. He, he messing the whole team up, you know what I mean? I want to see what Wendell, Wendell Carter going to do. Is that, is that, ain't that the guy we drafted? Yeah. Yeah, I want to see what he going to do. I kind of like his game. I don't think that, he, you know, it was on full display at Duke. But, you know, I just I don't like the way they run the Bulls, man. I'm I'm, I'm with LeBron, man. But let me tell you this. When's the last time you saw a picture of John Paxson? Because John Paxson, the player, looks nothing like John Paxson, the executive. John Paxson, the executive, looks like one of those dudes in the movies that got the briefcase that's hard on the outside and, like, the blue shirt with the white collar. Like, he went full villain. Yeah, I, heard, I, heard John, I heard John Paxson think he a gangster now, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, he that's tried to choke out Vinny Del Negro, John allegedly. Yeah, hey. John Paxson, man, he must be with the mob or something in Chicago right now, man. I don't know why he did, who he think he is, though. <laughs> now, uh, I'm assuming Eric gets y'all the dope uh, Rams tickets now. Yeah, definitely, man. You know what I mean? I'd be glad when they stop playing at the Coliseum, though, man. I'm tired of going there, man. That is an uncomfortable place to watch a game. Really? Yeah, I do not like the Coliseum at all. I'm good on the Coliseum. I'd be glad that when they keep moving to the new stadium, that's going to be great. Yeah, I haven't actually been in the Coliseum. I've been around the Coliseum, but not in it. Oh, man, you ain't missing nothing. That is one of the worst places to go watch a football game, the Coliseum. You do not want to go watch a game there. <laughs> well, I imagine, like, what's it like rolling through the Coliseum with Eric Dickinson of the Los Angeles Rams, as he put it in that interview? <laughs> oh, man, you got you to stop with him to sign autographs every two seconds, man. So, <laughs> you know, he a legend out here, man. He definitely an L.A. legend, you know, even before they brought the team back, you know. He was L.A. legend, so you know it's Eric Dixon. You know, I'm glad that I'm glad that he's working for the team and and all of that, and they got him involved in the team. You know what I mean? That you know that's definitely that's definitely good. I feel like that was a must. They had to do that. Indeed, well, hey man, that is our man Freddie Gibbs. Check out Freddie. Like I said, we can't tell him to go in stores. Get on the internet, and you can figure out how to get Freddie. I actually had to order it on vinyl just so I could have that crazy picture in full form. Oh yeah, we definitely got the vinyl. We got them pillows out there too. So you know, go cop one of them pillow bags. You got too, pillows, man. Freddie. Yes, sir. I can't have you. I can't have. I, I can't have you in my bed. On that, like that. <laughs> that's that's the level I can't go to. I can't frame it and put it on the wall. I can't. That that I cannot do. Nah, just just throw it on the couch or something like a throw pillow somewhere. You know. <laughs> I'm trying to think. If I walk into a woman's house and she had the Freddie Gibbs pillow on her bed, I I can't tell if that is the coolest thing in the world or a sign that maybe I need to roll out. Hey man, we got pillows and I'm about to come with neon signs too. Freddie neon signs. We're gonna be selling them too. <laughs> Hey, man, dude, make that happen. Congratulations on everything, man. And keep, keep me posted on the bandana because like you got my man, hopes up on that. Man. Congrats on that high noon, too, man. One of my favorite shows, man. Keep it up, bro. Hey, man, I appreciate it, man. I'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. Thanks to Freddie Gibbs for joining us. Thanks to my man Gabe Bassane. He handles everything behind the scenes. Remember to rate us and review us. Give us five stars. They only give us four stars. I'm going to have to think that you are some kind of hater. Uh, we will be back on next week. We'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.